In the last video, we derived the Schwarzschild metric for the curved spacetime around an uncharged, non-rotating spherical mass. In this video, we're going to interpret what this metric means. We're going to look at the physical meaning of the r and t coordinates, how we get gravitational time dilation for observers at different distances from the mass, and give physical meaning to the Schwarzschild radius rs as the event horizon, a surface beyond which light can never escape. An important idea in this video is that the coordinates we put on spacetime geometry, like t, r, theta, and phi, don't always have an obvious physical meaning, and we should not trust them to give us important physical information. We should only trust the metric tensor g to properly make measurements of time and space. Let's start by talking about the time coordinate c, t and how it relates to the gravitational time dilation for observers at different distances from the spherical mass. In this video, I'm only going to cover radial motion near the mass, so motion that goes directly toward or away from the mass, along the r-coordinate. This means I'm going to ignore the theta and phi angle coordinates, and I can treat spacetime as two-dimensional, with only a time coordinate ct and a radial coordinate r. So, I'm only going to use the C, T, and R entries from the Schwarzschild metric. On a spacetime diagram, the center of the mass would be located at R equals zero, as it moves through time, where time points upward on the spacetime diagram. Given these coordinate lines for C, T, and R, the tangent vectors along these lines would give us the basis vectors E, T, and E, R which are the partial derivatives with respect to the c, t, and r coordinates, respectively. Now, looking at this space-time diagram with our eyes, we might assume that all these time basis vectors are the same length, but that's actually not true. In relativity, we should never trust our eyes or trust space-time coordinates for making measurements. Instead, we need to trust the metric, which is the Schwarzschild metric in this case. The squared length of the ET basis vector is ET dot ET, which equals the GTT component of the metric, which is 1 minus RS over R. So the length of all these time basis vectors depends on their R coordinate in spacetime. So let's take a look at the lengths of all these time basis vectors in different parts of our spacetime diagram, where this vertical dashed line is the mass's Schwarzschild radius. As r goes to infinity, very far away from the mass, rs over r goes to 0, so the squared length of the et basis vector goes to 1, as we move infinitely far from the mass. As we approach the Schwarzschild radius rs from the outside, the length of the et basis vector gets smaller and smaller, but its squared length is still positive. It's worth noting that, outside the Schwarzschild radius, the ET basis vector has a positive squared length, and so it's a time-like vector. Directly on top of the Schwarzschild radius, where RS equals R, the GTT component becomes 1 minus 1 equals 0. This means that on the Schwarzschild radius, the ET basis vector is a light-like vector, and points along the world line of a light beam. When R is less than the Schwarzschild radius, the squared length of ET becomes negative, meaning it is now a space-like vector, and observers can freely travel along it in the positive and negative directions. The idea that ET can be light-like or space-like is probably pretty confusing, but I'll discuss the meaning of this later in the video. For now, let's just focus on the region outside of the Schwarzschild radius, where ET is time-like and its squared length is positive. Since the length of the ET basis vector is different for each r position, this means that observers moving through time at various constant r values will experience time differently. We also saw a similar effect in Relativity 105b, in flat space time, in the accelerated reference frame given by the Rindler coordinate system. Observers at different constant x values in Rindler coordinates experience different amounts of proper time for the same amount of coordinate time, because the lengths of their time basis vectors are different.
although the effect is not the exact same because the Rindler metric and the Schwarzschild metric have different TT components. To calculate the total proper time along a world line parameterized by a path parameter lambda, we break up the world line into small pieces, measure each piece using the metric, and add the results together. In the limit of infinitesimally small pieces, this is the same thing as integrating over the length of the curve's tangent vectors d by d lambda, which is the square root of the tangent vector dotted with itself. So let's use the Schwarzschild metric to calculate gravitational time dilation. We can use multivariable chain rule to expand the tangent vector in terms of the spacetime coordinates. And in the special case of spacetime motion along a constant r value, these go to zero. And since we're free to use any path parameter that we like, we can just set lambda to ct. These go to one, and we get the square root of gtt. Since the gtt component of the metric only depends on the r variable and not the t variable, we can bring it outside the integral. And the integral of dct just becomes ct. So we find that we can't just read time along a world line from the ct coordinate. Instead, there's a conversion factor between t and the proper time and this conversion factor depends on the r-coordinate. If we compare the gravitational time dilation formula to the kinematic time dilation formula from special relativity, we find that the velocity term corresponds to the escape velocity for the mass at a given radius, the square root of 2mg over r. Very far away from the mass, as r goes to infinity, the conversion factor becomes 1. So very far away, coordinate time t and proper time tau are the same thing, for a constant r position. But the closer we go to the Schwarzschild radius, the smaller this conversion factor becomes. So the same amount of coordinate time results in much less proper time. For example, at a distance of two Schwarzschild radii, the conversion factor becomes the square root of one half which is about 0.7071. So the proper time for someone at a distance of 2rs is equal to the square root of 1 half times the coordinate time, where the coordinate time is basically the proper time for someone at an infinite distance away from the mass. This means that 100 years for someone far away is experienced as only 70 years for someone hovering at a distance of two Schwarzschild radii. This is the effect of gravitational time dilation, where observers at different constant distances from a mass experience different proper times. As a consequence, if we have one observer at a constant position r1, and a second observer at a constant position r2, we can directly compare their respective proper times by taking the ratio of their gravitational time dilation formulas and cancelling the ct coordinate. Now, it should be noted that this simple relationship only holds for the special case of observers at constant r coordinates and constant theta and phi coordinates. Under the influence of only gravity, these observers would naturally fall towards the mass. So these observers must be using rockets to maintain their constant r position, or else they must be standing on the surface of the mass itself, held upward by the electromagnetic forces of the mass's particles. This means that all observers at constant r coordinates must have a non-zero four acceleration vector that's pushing them away from the freefall geodesics that lead towards the mass. So they would all measure a non-zero proper acceleration on an accelerometer that they are carrying with them. Just like the accelerometer on the cell phone of someone standing on Earth measures non-zero proper acceleration. If we introduce motion that's infalling or outgoing, or angular orbital motion, this simple relation between t and tau no longer holds true. The correct way to compare proper time along two arbitrary world lines is always to integrate the tangent vectors along those world lines and compare the resulting proper times.
Now let's look at the physical interpretation of the R coordinate. The R coordinate helps us measure distance, but as you can probably guess from the GRR component of the metric, the R coordinate doesn't directly represent physical distance L0, which is also called proper distance or proper length. The proper distance between two points in space is the distance we would get if we laid out a series of meter sticks end to end between the two points. We calculate proper length L0 by integrating the tangent vectors along a curve, but this curve must be space-like, where the squared length of the tangent vectors are negative. We can again expand the tangent vector using multivariable chain rule then use the special case where the t-coordinate is constant, and take the r-coordinate to be the path parameter, with these going to 1, and then we get the square root of negative grr. After we sub in the grr component, we see that we have a problem. This factor depends on r, and since the integral is over the r variable, we can't just pull this factor out of the integral. So in flat Minkowski space-time, the proper length between two points A and B along an r-coordinate line is exactly equal to the change in the Minkowski r-coordinate value between the two points. But in Schwarzschild space-time, there's a more complicated relationship between the Schwarzschild r-coordinate and proper length, involving this integral. We can see that a small proper length dl0 is related to a small change in the r-coordinate dr by this square root factor. When the r-coordinate is much much larger than the Schwarzschild radius, this conversion factor goes to 1. So far enough away from the mass, the r-coordinate difference between two points is equal to the proper length between those two points. But as we get closer and closer to the Schwarzschild radius, this conversion factor gets larger and larger, meaning one unit of r corresponds to more than one unit of proper length. This means that the region of our space-time diagram that's close to the Schwarzschild radius contains much more physical space than the region far from the Schwarzschild radius, even though it doesn't look like it on our space-time diagram. We can see this concretely if we actually compute this integral. According to the free online textbook, Exploring Black Holes, we can compute this integral by performing the substitution r equals z squared. And originally I wasn't able to do this integral, but my boyfriend showed me how to do it using a trig substitution. So special thanks to him for his help. And you can pause the video if you want to go through it yourself. We change variables to y to turn this into a 1, do another substitution with hyperbolic cosine, change back to y, use this identity to convert inverse hyperbolic cosine to a natural logarithm, plug that in, do some algebra, change back to z, and finally change back to r, absorbing this constant into the constant of integration, which goes away when we plug in integral limits anyway. We end up with this equation for proper length, to be evaluated at two r positions. Note that this formula is only valid in the space-time region outside of the Schwarzschild radius. If we take a high point of r equals 3 Schwarzschild radii and a low point of r equals 2 Schwarzschild radii, this is a change in 1 rs in the r-coordinate. But our proper length formula tells us this is actually a change of 1.3 rs in actual proper length, which is larger. And if the high point is 2 rs and the low point is 1 rs, the change in the r-coordinate is again 1 rs. But the actual proper length is 2.3 rs, which is even larger. So we can see that, as we approach the Schwarzschild radius, one unit of the r-coordinate is worth larger and larger amounts of proper length. If we plot this function for proper length and compare it to the flat space case where r equals proper length, we can see that there's an obvious difference near the Schwarzschild radius.
But if we zoom out at the scale of 100 Schwarzschild radii or more, there is very little difference between the R coordinate and the actual proper length from flat space time. So, practically speaking, when we're far away from an object's Schwarzschild radius, we can act as if the Schwarzschild R coordinate is measuring true physical distances in space. We only start seeing noticeable differences between the R coordinate and proper length when we're close to the mass's Schwarzschild radius. Another way to understand the Schwarzschild R coordinate is to look at how it relates to the circumference of circles around the mass. If we were to take a constant time, constant r, and constant angle theta of pi over 2, and allow the angular phi coordinate to vary, we can compute the proper distance around a circle. We can do this through our typical process of integrating over the lengths of tangent vectors in the special case where only the phi variable changes, and all the other variables are constant. Using phi as our path parameter, we get the conversion factor between phi and proper length to be the square root of negative g phi phi. Looking at the metric, g phi phi is just negative r squared sine theta squared. But sine theta goes to 1 since theta is just a constant of pi over 2 we can pull r out of the integral, and the integral of d phi is just phi. This is an interesting result, because r times phi is the standard circle arc length formula that we see in flat space. For example, for an angle of phi equals 2 pi, we get the standard formula 2 pi r for the circumference of a circle around the mass. So, even though the R coordinate doesn't directly measure the physical radius to the mass, it does accurately measure the circumference of circles around the mass according to the standard flat space arc length formula, R times phi. So, in short shield spacetime, given a circle around the mass, radial distances inside the circle are larger than we'd expect in flat space, given the circle's circumference. So essentially, near the Schwarzschild radius, space is bigger on the inside. This is explained by the curvature of space itself, so that the distance between concentric circles is increased due to the curvature of space. The surface traced out by these circles is called Flam's paraboloid. It represents a two-dimensional slice of space at constant ct and theta equals pi over 2 so where only r and phi are allowed to vary. The third dimension in this diagram doesn't correspond to anything physical, but it helps us visualize the curvature of space, so that the distances we see with our eyes actually correspond to the real distances in curved space. Far from the mass, space is almost flat, which is why the r coordinate very nearly matches proper distance but space gets significantly more curved close to the Schwarzschild radius. You can check the links in the description to learn more about Flam's paraboloid. The last thing we'll do in this video is to give an interpretation to the Schwarzschild radius Rs, which corresponds to the event horizon of a black hole. You might have noticed that one of the components of the Schwarzschild metric goes to infinity when R equals zero and another component goes to infinity when r equals rs. We call these points singularities. It turns out that the r equals zero singularity is a true singularity in the geometry of spacetime. It's a point where the manifold of spacetime comes together in a pinch and just stops. And our theory of general relativity doesn't make sense anymore. But the singularity at rs is not a true geometric singularity. It's just a singularity resulting from our choice of coordinate system. You might notice that in 2D polar coordinates, the coordinate system stops making sense at the origin, because any value of the angle coordinate gives the same point, and the radius r can't become negative. This means that coordinate derivatives and basis vectors don't make sense at the origin. But this is not because of the geometry of the flat 2D plane. It's only due to the choice of coordinate system we've used. If we change to Cartesian coordinates, the origin has derivatives and basis vectors defined on it just fine.
The singularity at r equals rs in the Schwarzschild coordinates is exactly this type of coordinate singularity that results from the Schwarzschild coordinates. We can describe the same Schwarzschild geometry in other coordinate systems, like kruskal sakaris coordinates, where the Schwarzschild radius no longer causes a coordinate singularity. But I'm going to cover that in a later video. For now, we'll just do the best we can with the Schwarzschild coordinates. So we know that the Schwarzschild radius rs is 2gm over c squared. It only depends on the mass of the object and some physical constants. Since g is very small and c squared is very big, the Schwarzschild radius is very small for most objects. For example, the Schwarzschild radius for the Earth is only about 1 centimeter, and the Schwarzschild radius for the Sun is only about 3 kilometers. Both of these are deep inside the physical radius of each body. When an object is so incredibly massive and dense that its Schwarzschild radius becomes larger than its physical radius, we call this object a black hole, and we call the Schwarzschild radius the black hole's event horizon. If we imagine a super dense object like this, we could understand how it curves space-time by calculating how light behaves near it. In other words, we could calculate the light-like geodesics, which are the geodesics where all the tangent vectors have a squared length of zero. To make things simple, we are only going to consider light beams traveling in a radial direction, so directly toward or away from the mass, with constant theta and phi coordinates. So if we take the squared length of the tangent vector to be zero, and expand in terms of space-time coordinates, we get this formula with the metric. Normally the metric is 4 by 4, but if we assume radial motion only, we can ignore the theta and phi coordinates and assume a 2 by 2 metric, which gives us this formula if we plug in GTT and GRR. If we move this term to the other side, then multiply both sides by 1 minus RS over R, we get this. And we can take the square root of both sides to remove the squares and get a plus or minus sign. Again, the path parameter lambda can be anything we want, so let's choose lambda equals ct, which means this goes to 1 and we get this. So if we multiply both sides by c, it kind of looks like the distance over time derivative is telling us that the speed of light is changing by this factor here. So you might wonder if this means the speed of light is changing due to gravity. Well, it depends on what you mean by speed. Again, we can only trust the metric for making physical measurements. We can't trust our eyes or trust the r and t coordinates. We know the t coordinate is the proper time for someone infinitely far away from the mass, and r does not measure proper length. So dr by dt is just a ratio between coordinates, and it doesn't always have any particular physical meaning. However, the local speed of light, which is the derivative of proper distance with respect to proper time, is always equal to c. This is an objective fact that is true for all space-time geometries and all coordinate systems. We saw something similar in Relativity 105f, where an accelerated observer in flat space-time saw light beams with changing slope in Rindler coordinates but the local speed of light dl0 by d tau was still c. So given this relationship for the paths of light beams in Schwarzschild coordinates, if we take the reciprocal of both sides and multiply by r over r, we get this differential equation, which has a solution involving log. When I write log, I'm talking about log base e or what some people call the natural logarithm, or ln. So if y equals log of u, this means that u equals e to the y, and also the derivative of log u is 1 over u. We can calculate the derivative of this solution to confirm it satisfies the differential equation. Taking the derivative of ct with respect to r, this goes to 1. The derivative of this constant k goes to 0 and the derivative of log gives us 1 over the input of the logarithm, times a chain rule term, 
which is just dr by dr, which is just positive 1. We can replace this plus or minus 1 with plus or minus r minus rs over r minus rs. And this rs and this rs always have opposite sign, regardless of whether we select the plus solution or the minus solution. So they cancel. And we get plus or minus r over r minus rs which can also be written as plus or minus 1 over 1 minus rs over r, which is the derivative we were expecting from our differential equation. So this is a valid solution. So this solution has a linear part, a logarithmic part, and a constant part. If we graph the linear and logarithmic functions, we see that the logarithmic function changes very quickly when its input is close to zero but very far away from zero, it doesn't change very much. So when we add the linear and logarithmic functions together, we expect the logarithmic part to dominate when the log input is close to zero, and for the linear part to dominate as we move farther and farther away. If we plot a bunch of light beams going into the mass, which corresponds to the negative sign here, with different starting constants, we get curves like this. The Schwarzschild radius rs is where the input of the logarithm becomes zero. So all the ingoing light beams bunch up here. So according to these geodesics, these light beams never actually cross the Schwarzschild radius. Even if an observer far from the mass waits a really long time, gravitational time dilation means this long amount of time corresponds to smaller and smaller proper times for objects near the Schwarzschild radius. Clocks here tick slower and slower, such that nothing will ever cross the Schwarzschild radius from the perspective of an outside observer. Things will just freeze slightly before the crossing point. The reverse is true for outgoing light beams, which correspond to the plus sign in our solutions. According to an outside observer, light beams near the Schwarzschild radius appear nearly stuck in place due to time dilation but eventually they escape and return to their expected trajectory when space-time becomes flat again. It's important to remember, though, that observers near the Schwarzschild radius won't notice anything strange going on with light. According to them, the local speed of light, which is proper distance over proper time, is still c. It's only observers far away from the Schwarzschild radius that observe slowly ticking clocks for clocks near the Schwarzschild radius. Now, what about light beams that are in the region inside the Schwarzschild radius? These have a very similar solution to the same differential equation, except we swap the signs of r and rs inside the logarithm, so their difference stays positive. Taking the derivative leads to the same final result because the minus sign cancels with a chain rule term. Plotting both the plus and minus solutions, we get light beams that look like this. All of these geodesics point towards the black hole's singularity at r equals zero. This means that, if light gets inside the black hole's event horizon, it is a mathematical impossibility for light to get outside again. Every single light-like geodesic inside the event horizon travels into the singularity no matter what. If we look at the light cones outside the event horizon on our space-time diagram, they appear to get more and more squished as we approach the event horizon. This makes sense because we know the Schwarzschild r-coordinate represents larger proper lengths closer to the event horizon. On the event horizon itself, the light cone collapses to a vertical line. The meaning of this would be more clear in another coordinate system, but this basically means that outgoing light beams get stuck at a constant r-coordinate when they are exactly on the event horizon. Inside the event horizon, the light cones flip sideways and point towards the singularity at r equals zero. We can understand this by looking at the squared length of the time basis vector. Outside the event horizon, the squared length of the ET basis vector is positive meaning ET gives a time-like direction. On the event horizon, the squared length is zero, so ET points in a light-like direction. And inside the event horizon, the squared length is negative, meaning the T-coordinate is space-like, 
and we can travel along it in either direction. If we look at the squared length of the R basis vector, outside the event horizon it's negative, and so the R coordinate is space-like. It is undefined on the event horizon in this coordinate system, and inside the event horizon the R coordinate is time-like. So all massive objects are forced to travel along the R coordinate in the direction of the light cone. So inside the event horizon we have a strange switching of roles where the T coordinate is space-like and the R coordinate is time-like. This is another situation where we can't trust coordinates to have obvious physical meaning. The strange swapping of the roles of the T and R coordinates is the result of the coordinate system we're using. But we can trust the metric tensor to tell us that, inside the event horizon, the R basis vector gives a time-like direction with positive squared length, and the T basis vector gives space-like directions with negative squared length. Now, you might still have some additional questions, like how do we know that light-like geodesics inside the event horizon always face inward, instead of outward? Or how do we know the light-like geodesic on the event horizon corresponds to an outgoing geodesic, instead of an inward geodesic? These questions will be answered in Relativity 108D when we look at alternative coordinate systems for Schwarzschild geometry where we can clearly see light beams crossing into the event horizon and how light beams inside the event horizon can never escape and are doomed to head into the singularity. So to summarize this video, we learned that we can't always rely on coordinates on a space-time diagram for direct physical meaning. Instead, we should always rely on the metric to give us physical measurements of time and space. We learned that the Schwarzschild T coordinate corresponds to the time measured by someone infinitely far away from the spherical mass in the Schwarzschild geometry, and that this time coordinate corresponds to smaller and smaller amounts of proper time for someone who is closer to the mass. This effect is called gravitational time dilation. We also learned that the Schwarzschild R coordinate doesn't match directly with physical lengths, also called proper lengths and that one unit of the R coordinate closer to the mass corresponds to a physical length that's longer than one unit. However, the R coordinate does give an accurate physical circumference of a circle surrounding the mass, using the simple arc length formula R times phi that we're used to in flat space. This means that there is a larger physical radius than expected for a given physical circumference according to flat geometry. So we conclude that space itself becomes more curved as we move closer to the mass. Finally, we said that when a mass's Schwarzschild radius becomes greater than its physical radius, we get a black hole. From the perspective of an outside observer, light and massive objects that fall toward a black hole never appear to cross the event horizon due to the increasingly large effects of gravitational time dilation. An outgoing beam of light directly on the event horizon will remain frozen in place, and inside the event horizon, all light beams and masses are forced to fall into the singularity, because all time-like and light-like geodesics fall into the singularity, so it's a mathematical impossibility for anything to escape. In the next video, we'll calculate a wider variety of time-like and light-like geodesics in Schwarzschild geometry and see how massive objects and light beams orbit around masses.